As we gather to remember and share stories of faith, let us rejoice in the presence of God. Before our stories began, there was God. Through all our days, God walks with us. God's creative presence is moving among us. In warm sunlight and bright snow, in the seasons of color and courage. Creative, creative God, God is, is in our midst. midst. As we seek to answer your call to follow, and grow in faith and love for one another. May, May we, we be open, open to your presence around and, and within. within. Let us pray. For all that is our life, we offer thanks and praise, as we are called to use that gift to build the store of common good. We ask for courage to follow you, and ask that we might know more fully that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle, to the universe, to this community, to each other, and to you. Amen. Amen. Welcome, friends. Welcome to a place that has seen times like these before. Welcome to a place where the music echoes not just in a room, but in time. Welcome to a place where love is understood as the only force in the world capable of meeting the challenges of today. Welcome, friends, to your living room or wherever you might find yourself this morning because wherever you are joining us for worship this morning, it is right now a sanctuary. It is a place that you are setting apart to give thanks to God and to understand the interconnectedness of all life, including yours, even from home. So welcome to the First Congregational Church of Burlington, Vermont. We are in an open and affirming church of the United Church of Christ. This means that no matter who you are, no matter who you love or what kind of body you have, no matter where you are on your life or your faith journey, whether you are sinner or saint, a little bit of both, skeptic or seeker or a little bit of both, full of faith or full of doubts, this is a place that understands the image of God is in us all. 
we are better for your presence here this morning. So I would invite you to light a candle if you have one and are able, as I have done down by the pulpit, that we might be reminded that we worship this morning in the presence of God and one another. And join with me now in singing our opening hymn. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Listen now, for the Spirit of God is speaking to you. Immediately after his baptism, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Here ends the reading. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of this scripture. I'd like to begin this time of unburdening with a reading by the Reverend Holly McKissick called Resist. Resist is an active word. It takes practice, effort, I heard the command over and over in my daughter's ballet class. After a pirouette, the teacher would call out, pause, hold, resist. After a delay, a hanging in the air, the dancers would place their heel gently on the floor and come to a rest. Every turn, every lunge, every grand plie was followed by that same instruction, pause, hold, resist. Resist the pull of gravity for just a second. Resist the urge to land where you normally land. Resist. It's a command that runs through scripture from the midwives who resisted Pharaoh to Jesus who resisted temptation. And it's a helpful word for Lent, which began Wednesday. Resist your typical response. Resist yelling at the kids when you are frustrated. Resist withdrawing when you are depressed. Lent asks, what do you need to resist? Consumption? Taking on too much? Being too hard on yourself? Hopelessness? Apathy? Turning a blind eye? Resist. It takes 40 days and then some. In the 1700s, Marie Durand was imprisoned in France in the Tower of Constance for 38 years for practicing her faith. And during her long imprisonment, she used her finger to carve the French word résisté into a stone block. It takes a long time to carve stone with your finger, and so it is with Lent. 
If our goal is to be different people come Easter Sunday than we are today, we must take time, step back, and evaluate our patterns. It will take active effort, intentional practice, a supportive community. If you want to land somewhere different, pause, hold, resist. Here ends the reading. So for our prayer confession today, what I'd really like is for you to spend a moment in silence, pondering what it is you need to resist this Lent. What separates you from God? If you are willing, you can name it in the chat now because Lent is about being brave in our examinations of ourselves and in our work with community. What are you going to work on resisting? I'm going to work on resisting my impatience. So let us pray. Holy One, we offer to you now our resistance to the status quo, to the death-dealing forces of the world, to the tug of apathy. So strengthen our resistance in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, friends, I do have some good news. This season of Lent reminds us that God is present in the joyful times and in the lean ones. And this six-week journey, well, it goes through the leanest of places, the worst temptations of the human heart. And at the end, God emerges victorious. Love emerges victorious. Life emerges victorious. So whatever that it is that you turned over to God, Friends, know that it pales in comparison to God's boundless mercy and forgiveness for you. So to prepare ourselves to truly receive that news in Lent, we focus on the buildup. We remind ourselves of the journey to the cross, just as it might have been for those first disciples, without the knowledge of the joy that was to come. As a reminder of this, it has been the tradition in many churches since as early as the 5th century to put away the alleluias, so to refrain from singing or saying this word because it is so associated with Easter and the weeks that lead up to it. So David is going to play a repeating alleluia to get it out of our system, so to speak. And while he does so, I'm going to physically put this banner away in preparation for our discipleship work in this time. So friends, I have put the Alleluia banner away and Lent has officially begun. In fact, today we start a series to learn from those first disciples about what that first lead up to the cross was like 
and what we can learn from them about what it means to follow Jesus today. To help us with that, we've invited a few of those first disciples to come speak with us in the next few weeks. And our first to speak with us today is the disciple Peter, who I invited to start uh, by answering a few questions we thought the children and youth might be particularly interested in. Take a look. Simon Peter, welcome. Thank you. It is so good to have you with us here today at First Church. Now, I happen to think that it's one of the really amazing things that we have this scripture and modern technology and they can work together to, to bring you here with us today. And, and I think you know that in just a bit, I'm going to ask you to kind of tell us your whole story about what it meant to be there with Jesus during sure. his ministry and to be one of those earliest disciples. But I know that our kids are uh, going to have some questions, so I thought it would be good for us to start off like this, a bit more informally with um, some questions they might have. And, and the first one is, I think, a simple one. Um, what, it, what does it really mean to be a disciple? What's a disciple? Great question. And um, it's, a, it's a big word, and it means really to be a student or a follower, a, a, a student of a teacher or a follower of a leader. Yeah. And I'm a disciple of Jesus, which means I'm a student of Jesus and a, a follower of Jesus. And I, I consider Jesus my teacher because he has things to teach me about life, about how to treat other people, about how to treat myself. Mm -hmm. And I consider him my leader because when I live my life the way he lives his life, and like he wants me to live mine, I feel better and think better and I'm more connected to the people around me and I can help them more. So yeah. so that's how I understand being a disciple and, and being a disciple of Jesus. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, I think one of our goals for this period leading up to Easter is to really learn from you all, those first disciples who were closest to them and really try and follow your examples and how to be a good disciple. So, so thank you for that answer. And the second question is really more of a, a personal one. I see there on your, on your screen that you have two names and sometimes we call you Simon and sometimes we call you Peter. And I, I know that uh, people sometimes ask me what that's all about. So can you just say why you have two names? That's a great question. They ask me too a lot. And it's, it's kind of, it's confusing because I have, I have two names, Simon, Peter. Um, and although it seems strange today, that was really not uncommon uh, in the olden days and in the Bible times. But Simon is my original name. That was the name that my that I was born with, that my parents gave me, and the name I answered my whole life until I met Jesus. And uh, Simon means the one who hears the word of God. And that's the name my parents gave me. And I, I definitely heard the word of God when I met Jesus. So Simon's my original name. And uh, when I met Jesus, uh, he told me that he would be changing my name. And not long after that, he started calling me Peter. Mm. Although he still called me Simon sometimes too, which was a little bit confusing, but I got used to it. So it was exactly when I told Jesus that I believed he was the son of God and the Messiah that's when he changed my name and started calling me Peter, which means, uh, from what I understand, it means a rock. Yeah. And so I think he thought I could be like a solid rock in his new church or something. And that's kind of what I what I strive to be. Yeah. What a great honor. And also, you know, a great example for what we are all trying to do. You know, when we're baptized, we all kind of take the last name um, of Christian and try and mm -hmm. join that family. So, so thank you for being the, the rock on which uh, we are all building our life. And, and thank you for joining me here in this informal way today. And um, I'm going to let you go right now and get ready to, to yeah. tell your full story, but it was really great uh, having you here. Thanks. Nice to be here with you and with everyone watching. Uh, it's good to be back in Capernaum. It's a smell I love. The Sea of Galilee smells like spring rain. It's been, what, a little over three years now since I've walked this shore. It's so good to be able to bring you, First Church, to my hometown. 
the wonders of technology, am I right? Thank you for inviting me to participate in your virtual service today and share a little bit of my story, my real story with you. You see, this is where the whole thing began. I was fishing for a living with my brother, Andrew. We did pretty well, too. Sure, I complained a lot, especially when my brother Andrew got all religious and took off after John the Baptist. But you know, that's where he met Jesus and brought him here to the Sea of Galilee to meet me. I'd been fishing all night long. It had been cold and damp, and to top it off, we hadn't caught a thing. I was in an angry mood. As I came into shore, there he was, looking right at me, smiling, like he knew something I didn't. Then he climbed right in the boat as if he owned it and just started up preaching to the crowd. Even though I had no use for this stuff, his words caught me somehow. He said something like, what good is it if someone gains the whole world but loses his soul? And the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a valuable treasure under the sea and sells all he has to own that precious fortune. And then he turned and looked right at me, I mean deep into my soul, and said, follow me, Peter, and I will make you a fisher of men. It was the way he said it that just pulled me in. I couldn't refuse him anything after that. I just dropped my nets and off we went. So then I came back here trying to figure out what on earth to do next after he was gone. Sitting by the water always helps me sort things out. I'm sure by now even you have heard how I let him down. Worst Passover ever. The whole thing came crashing down so fast. Listen, when they came to arrest him, I was mad. I was ready to die fighting. I nearly killed that first soldier, but he ducked and I only sliced off his ear. Big man, right? Me fighting Roman soldiers. An hour later, I'm standing around a fire outside the temple, waiting to see if Jesus will be freed. And next thing you know, this little servant girl points right at me and yells, you're one of them. I lied. I denied it. Not once, but three times that very night. I was so afraid, so confused. As the sun came up, they led Jesus out from the trial. I could tell he'd been smacked around. He looked right at me, and we both heard the rooster crow. All that fear turned to nauseating shame. It was the lowest, worst feeling I've ever had. The others found me there, sitting in the dirt, shaking and weeping. They took me back to this little room in a back alley. We stayed there for three days, locked up in the dark, confused, angry, scared, and dejected. Then, all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to us, alive. Well, I'll tell you the truth, I couldn't even look at him. The shame covered me like a heavy wet blanket. I felt dead. It was weeks later when he met us again here in Capernaum. We were just coming in from another lousy night of fishing. Then from the shore, he yelled, other side! We threw our nets and caught a boatload of fish just like that. Later at breakfast, we had some time together, just the two of us. I was so uncomfortable and guilty. Do you love me, Peter, he asked. I told him, yes, I did love him. He asked me three times, once for each time I denied him. Then he said to me what I've heard him say to so many others, Peter, your sins are forgiven. And it was done. Now I have to tell this story to everyone. The world has to hear this good news of Christ defeating death. But every time I act on my own, it goes really bad, like when I tried to walk on water. So this time I'll wait. I'll wait for him to guide me to what's next. And in the meantime, just live as he wants me to, in grace, forgiveness, and love. We are telling Peter's story. We are telling Peter's story. We are telling Peter's story. Sisters, brothers, all. Here we seek and find out 
mother's bone. Will you pray with me? God, may the words I speak and all our meditations be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Like many things, it hasn't happened all that much in the last year. But in non-COVID times, I get calls at least once, sometimes as many as two or three times per legislative session, asking me to speak at press conferences for particular issues facing the legislature. One such time in particular stands out in my memory because I felt so strongly about the legislation. Did I think the legislation was right and just and good? Absolutely. Did I agree to speak? No. I do sometimes agree, usually not to advocate for or against particular legislation, but to point out the human costs of certain aspects of the legislation or lack thereof. My job, I reason, is to help others follow Jesus as they do their work, not to do their job for them. And that holds true for all work, even legislative work. The speaking request, however, as I mentioned, was in fact in favor of a particular piece of legislation. And although I would be speaking under my own name, not the name of the church, my first thoughts were about who in the congregation would be advocating on either side. As if we all aren't sufficiently mature adults able to understand that we might disagree on policy matters. As if offending someone in the pews was more important than following Jesus. Aren't you a follower of Jesus? They asked. No, I'm not. I am a follower of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, The Crown, and Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. I follow Jennifer Lawrence's acting career. It's good and the New York Times editorialists. I follow a strict diet of coffee in the morning and the Iowa Hawkeyes. And depending on who is asking and how I'm feeling, I follow Jesus. Sure, I'd like to list Jesus first, but that would be misleading. Peter is not the only one who has a hard time claiming discipleship. You see, temptation doesn't always look like a man in a red suit with horns. Sometimes it sounds an awful lot like responsibility, good citizenship, manners, job security, respect. Surrounded by friends, Peter faced the arms soldiers easily, bravely, but where he couldn't go. That was when it wasn't his life on the line, but his respect. Are you a follower of Jesus? I am not. Because even the word discipleship is scary and threatening and always has been. It can bring up images of things like Jonestown, ignorance, blind faith that may or may not be well placed. Don't be a follower, we are told. Be a leader. Disciple also calls to mind Christians, which is another scary word. And I would argue it always has been. Yes, absolutely. Going to church on Christmas is expected of everyone, Christian or not. But it is not easy calling oneself Christian. I mean, really Christian, not in Vermont. But when has it ever been easy? I would say not ever, not even during the Crusades. If you were the one who had to stand up and say that you were pretty sure warfare wasn't what Jesus had in mind. Following Jesus has never meant what the dominant culture has tried to brand as Christianity. It did not mean the Crusades. It did not mean supporting slavery or redlining. It does not mean conservative news shows and inexplicable fear of homosexuality or any sexuality or gender identity, really. It does not mean America first. It does not mean Christian nationalism. So what does it mean? What if I said it meant being hungry? for the story of a young peasant overcoming an empire through their own sacrificial love. Instead of looking to God or yourself, many of us 
would think I was talking about Harry Potter or the Hunger Games or the Lord of the Rings, these things we watch incessantly on repeat because we are too afraid to identify with that story of Jesus in the same way. We have heard two stories this morning, Jesus's and Peter's, but really we have heard one story and it's ours. The story of wanting to follow but being afraid to say so or do so. The story of not doing the press conference and then beating yourself up for it. The story of wanting to give but being too afraid of your own bills. The story of feeling for the addict downtown but also wanting a nice, clean city. The story of wanting to be a follower of God but being tempted by the power of respect. Jesus's main temptation, be a miracle worker. Put on the one ring that rules them all, the title of God and King. And Peter, well, it turns out that the point where Peter couldn't follow was pretty much the same. He was willing to sacrifice himself in the garden, but when his life was no longer on the line, just his respect, he faltered. It wasn't death that was hard, it was life, the living. We all have different temptations, of course, things that draw us away from God and press conferences. But perhaps we look everywhere else but the Bible for meaning, everywhere but the life and promises of Jesus to explain this because we are afraid we will be just another Christian hypocrite. We are afraid we will never live up to Jesus, the one we follow. And guess what? We won't. And if Peter has anything to teach us, if the Christian story has anything to teach us, if the one we follow has anything to teach us, it's that that is okay. The times we falter, the times we doubt, that's where God does God's best work. So in fact, it's more than okay. It's faith. What does it mean to be a disciple? Friends, this Lent, you tell me. There's a whiteness in God's mercy Like the whiteness of the sea There's a kindness in God's justice Each and every one of you 
to join a Follow Me small group during this Lenten season. The young adult group will be having its very first meeting on Zoom at 11.30 today. And a number of other small groups have been organized and are scheduled for various times throughout the week. Visit our website or see this week's e-news for more information on these groups and for information on how to sign up for one. Now friends, as the offertory is played, let us respond wholeheartedly to Jesus' invitation and offer our gifts with great joy. Let us pray. God of boundless generosity, we offer these gifts right now to you with the knowledge that you are the source of every good thing. God, you have abundantly provided for us so we can abundantly share with others. 
God, we want to follow you and surrender to the radical way of your kingdom. So Spirit, empower us for the work to which we are called, today and every day. Amen. Once a month, we have been gathering on Zoom to do our prayer time, our prayers of the people, so that you can see one another and hear what is on your heart and mind in this time. It is one of my favorite parts of worship each month when I get to see all your faces and have your concerns, the joys and needs form the bulk of our prayer. So in just a few moments, we are going to display on the screen a link that we're going to ask you to type into your browser Clicking on it on the video won't work, but you can click on the link that is in the chat function now. Now, if you don't feel comfortable using Zoom, you can also call into this time. Just call to the, the number that is displayed on your screen and that works just as well. We want everyone to be able to participate in this. That's true whether it's your first time here or your 500th, whether you are comfortable with technology or not, whether you are in your pajamas, or dressed to the nines. This is about prayer and community, and for those things, we need you. Now we are going to wait just a few moments to get started to make sure that everyone has a chance to sign on. And then our time of prayer will close out our hour of worship this morning. Until then, friends, as the Reverend Phillips Brooks has said, do not pray for easy lives, pray to be stronger women and men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, but for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be the miracle, as you answer the call to follow in each choice you make and wonder at the richness of life that has come to you by the grace of God. Amen. Friends, I hope to see you uh, in prayer. Let us join one another now in prayer.